Welcome to the harbor. If you don't know me, I'm Mike Sains, the lead pastor here, and I'm delighted to see you as we kick off a brand new series entitled Stranger Things. Please don't look at your neighbor right now. They might think we're talking about them. Amen. Let me express my deep appreciation for your support in um, the loss of my mother last Sunday morning, whether it was a Facebook post, uh, a phone call, text, flowers that were sent, money that was given. Some of you even traveled the four and a half, five hours uh, to be there at the visitation or the funeral. Um, I'm uh, deeply grateful and thankful for uh, a church family with such support. And um, I'm happy to report some, some good news in the light of all that. And that is last Sunday morning, finding the courage to preach, 14 people give their heart to the Lord uh, in the morning service last Sunday. <clears throat> And with a full house and a little country church that would only seat about 120 people, um, God give me somehow um, an amazing um, focus to be able to preach the word of the Lord. And five more people gave their heart to Jesus Christ at Mom's funeral. So 19 people in the last week have changed from a road to hell to a road to heaven. So I'm very grateful. Thank you for your prayers for my dad, and uh, I, I desire that you would continue to pray for him. Um, so, Stranger Things, we're going to look at some things. We'll begin this brand new series, and we're going to talk about some weird things in the Bible. You don't want to miss it because there are some weird things in the Bible. There are some things in the Bible that, that are there that you never dreamed was there, and there are some things folks think are there that's not there. But no matter how strange or how weird it may be, we're going to get to the bottom of why God allowed it to make the Holy Scripture and understand why such oddities are left in the text so that God could show us something powerful. Like next Sunday when we talk about Balaam's ass, we are talking about the donkey. And God opened his mouth and he began to speak and reason with his owner. Then we're going to deal with some, some strange miracles that took place. Uh, some weird things in the Bible. Some, some healings that took place in some of the absolute craziest circumstances. Many of us would have missed the miracle because of, of not doing what God said do. Crazy things. And then we'll look at one of the great prophets of the Bible, Ezekiel, that preached some of the hardest messages, and some of them he didn't even preach. He just pantomimed. And we somehow think we're out of line because, you know, we do messages, we, we illustrate, then we do that. Well, that ain't nothing new. Ezekiel was doing that hundreds of years, thousands of years ago. Then we may even look at the chariot of fire. Uh, in the Word of God. But there's going to be some strange things and some oddities, some things that every time we get together, we're going to look at it and you're going to say, man, how in the world is God going to bring some good out of that? And by the time we tie it up, you're going to say, God knew exactly what he was doing when he put that in the text. Amen? Amen. So if strange things have ever happened to you, and I would say probably has, I know it has me, I, as a matter of fact, I've been one guilty of doing some strange things sometimes. Amen. You don't have to say amen. But um, anyway, I've done some things like that. But today I want to take you to a story. And it comes out of 1 King, or excuse me, 1 Samuel uh, chapter number 18. And I want to look at the thought or the topic of reassurance today. I want to talk about reassurance when the odds are against you. I don't know about you, but I have oftentimes felt in life that, that the deck was stacked, that odds were against what I was trying to do or accomplish, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we as Christians need sometimes just a little bit of reassurance where God would help us to understand that in a world where it seems like everything is stacked against us, because the Bible says we are in this world, but not of this world. Amen? Amen. We're pilgrims passing through. This is a sojourn for us. This is not home. And we oftentimes get bogged down because we don't have the same values the world has. And we don't have the same outlook because we don't serve the same God. 
And so we're going to look at some things when we're surrounded by liars. Don't look around you right now. Surrounded by liars and perhaps leakers or people that would put out a bad report about you. Backstabbers and the odds are all against us and it seems like we're going to surely fail. I want to remind you of a few people. They were Jews, deported, exiled to a foreign land. We have people like uh, Joseph and Daniel, Nehemiah, Esther. And I could go on, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. I could go on and on talking to you. Uh, Ruth was another. Naomi and Elimelech. And I could go on and on talking to you about how God safeguarded his people, even in a foreign land. And God knows how to watch after us when the odds were stacked against us or when the odds were stacked against them, at least in the eyes of many. Yet God gave them miraculous favor that, that could not be denied. Even their enemies said, their God is God. They each rose to prominence and power. Why? Because God was on their side. Don't ever take for granted what it means to have the favor of God on your life. I'd rather be broke with the favor of God on my life than be a millionaire. I'd rather be homeless and have the favor of God on my life than have a mansion on a hill somewhere. I'd rather have the favor of God on my life than the best job that you could describe. I'd rather have the favor of God on my life than the best relationship that you could ever describe or, or the best socioeconomic status or, or, or the best of any of that. I'd rather have God's favor on my life because I can show you time and time again men, women, children who had the favor of God on their life and absent all other things and they prevailed. They came out on top because God was for them. The story this morning comes from 1 Samuel chapter 18. It's a story about David and Saul and a few other characters that I'll share with you. But I'd like to pick up reading in verse number 5. And I'll read a little bit and commentate just a little bit if that's all right. The Bible says, when, whatever Saul asked David to do, David did it successfully. Do you see that? That's really important. Whatever he was asked to do, he did it successfully. Saul made him a commander over the men of war, an appointment that was welcomed by the people and Saul's officers alike. When the victorious Israelite army was returning home after David had killed the Philistine, you remember the Goliath, the nine foot plus giant that was taunting Israel for 40 days. And, you know, David returned after killing him. He walked around with the head of Goliath in his hand. Uh, David did not even have a sword. He did not have armor. But he said to the Philistine giant, you have today defied the armies of the Lord God of Israel. And I don't come to you with a sword and a spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. And he flung a stone and it hit him right here. The only place that was open in his forehead right here that he might see. And uh, that stone hit him right here. He fell. David runs over, grabs Goliath's sword, and cuts Goliath's head off with his own sword. How could such a boy prevail against such a man? Well, I'm telling you, when God is on your side, you don't have to fret. He was not sitting there worried and shaking like Saul and all of the other armed men of Israel. And then when he was coming back from killing this giant, the women began to grab tambourines and cymbals, and their seven says they sang a song that said, Saul has killed his thousands, and David has killed his ten thousands. It made Saul very angry. What's this, Saul said. You know, Saul's like, I'm the king here. What is this? And they credit David with 10,000 and me with only thousands. Next, they'll be making him king. What, what he don't realize 
is God has already sent Samuel several years ago to the house of Jesse the Bethlehemite. And God, and in his mind, had already coronated David king, although it hadn't happened yet physically. David had already had a container of oil poured upon his head. And already Samuel said the Spirit of God left Saul and rest upon David. Verse 10 says the next day, watch this, a tormenting spirit from God overwhelmed Saul. God allowed a troubling spirit to trouble Saul. And in his house, he was troubled and he, he, he couldn't get it. You know, he was anxious. He was worried. He couldn't get his mind off of what he had heard. I've killed thousands. David's killed tens of thousands. And it goes on. And, and the Bible says that that anger, or, or, you know, he became very angry. And this anger turned uh, more violent. And then he was jealous. And the Bible says he began to eye. David. He kept his eye on him and he looked at him. And David was there to play a harp as he had did each day. Saul had a spear in his hand. Wonder what he was thinking. Wonder what he was meditating as this anger turned to jealousy. And jealousy turns to plotting and scheming. And while he's there and David's over here playing his harp skillfully like he had done for years and perhaps singing a song, all of a sudden Saul grabbed the javelin and he hurled it at David. The Bible says, intending to pin him to the wall. But David escaped, watch this, not one time, but twice. Now, do it to me once, it's kind of shame on you. Do it twice, it's shame on me, right? But how is it that, that David came back, brought the spear back, sat back down and began to play a song? How close are you to God that when your enemy attempts to murder you, that you decide not to walk out of your assignment, you decide not to leave and go back home to the hills of Judea, but you decide to sit back down in the living room and play your song one more time. So he's playing his song again, and I, now, now we're going to get to the strange thing in just a moment. Y'all just let me lay a little background here, if you will. And he's intending to pin him to the wall, not one time, but twice. So Saul was afraid of David. Why? Was he afraid of David? For the Lord was with David and had turned away from Saul. Finally, what's this? So Saul now, he's angry, he's mad, he's furious, he's plotting and scheming to kill him. And then he, he's so mixed up now, he can't even hit a man right there in his own house with his spear. Think of how he must have felt. David just now hit a man, I don't know how many feet away, with a sling. You with me? There's something about the favor of God. So Saul, he, he, so he comes up with this concoction. He sends him away and appoints him to be a commander over a thousand. What a promotion! At least I get him out of here. Get him out of here. Not only get him out of here, but more importantly, I put him in charge of a thousand warriors that fight all the time. Maybe he'll get killed. The devil sets you up all the time. For your demise. You see, but David, what's this, faithfully led his troops. Now I want you to understand something. By the outward appearance, Saul is still in control. Outwardly speaking, he has the throne, he has the army, he has the spears. Yet Saul was afraid of David. Why? Because the Lord was with him. There's something about having the peace of God in your life. The protection of God. So David continues to succeed in everything he's did. In verse number 14, the Lord was with him. He, then Saul recognized this. Watch this. And, and when Saul recognized every campaign David engaged in, everything he did, he had great success, and the people loved him. It's amazing when God fights for you. And the more they lie, and the more they leak, and the more they say this and that, the more God shows and exonerates you. Isn't that amazing? Um, so Saul, was recogn he, Saul recognized this. He became more afraid of him. 
But all of Israel, watch this, and Judah. You know who Israel and Judah? That's the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The whole country of Israel loved David because he was so successful at leading his troops into battle. Now, here's where we get to something strange. So uh, we're going to turn this a little bit. Now, let me take you back to, to 1983, I believe it was. I, my father-in-law had had a stroke, and so it do no good to ask him. So I walked into, I, first of all, I got my courage up, rehearsed my lines, and I was in Kelly's mom's house there, and I walked into the living room, got down on one knee, reached out and uh, asked my mother-in-law if I could have Kelly's hand in marriage. Y'all with me? I mean, that's the way I was just kind of taught to do it, that you show some respect would have done that to her dad, but his mental capacity wasn't there because of the stroke and so forth. And so I asked her, and, you know, to me, I thought it was going to be just a quick yes because I thought they were getting a pretty good deal coming into their family. <laughs> and indeed, it was a, a, a quick yes, and uh, I said that jokingly, but it was great. And that's the, way, that's the way we do it. Now, I have a friend of mine, Pastor Mwila Nande. He's in Zambia, Africa. Got married a few months ago, and he messaged me and said, Pastor, oh, I'm struggling. I said, what are you struggling with? And he says, well, I have to come up with a dowry. And I, I knew the term dowry from biblical times. <clears throat> and I said, well, how much is the dowry? It's $1,500, what it be in our country, $1,500. That, that dowry was what he had to pay Priscilla's father so that he could marry her. They still do that in Africa. And so, um, anyway, so he has to come up with this, and money is hard to come by over there. It's not like, I mean, you do a side job here, and you know, make $100 or $200 or whatever, and you sort of save that pretty quick. Well, over there, not so much. So he struggles, and he works for months, and he finally comes up with the $1,500, and he marries Priscilla, and they're a beautiful couple. In Bible times, men had to pay a dowry to the father, and it's a little different, di different in the Jewish culture than some of the other cultures, but it typically went like this. If you wanted to marry my daughter, <clears throat> then you had to bring whatever dowry I set. And it might be a monetary amount, and then it could be a deal worked out with cattle, with land, with service, or whatever. I'll give you an example. When Jacob come to, to Rachel's father, Laban, uh, Jacob didn't have the money. And he said, well, what could I do? And Jacob or Laban said, you could work for seven years. So seven years of service. And then, of course, we know he got tricked and uh, got the ugly girl instead of the pretty one. And so he said, he, he said, well, what can I do? He said, work seven more years. So he worked seven more years. So dowries kind of went like that. And now oftentimes in those days, a dowry was also set up so that the father would ask a certain amount. And, and a lot of fathers, not all of them, and it was totally up to them, they would say a certain amount of this is going to be given to his daughter to sort of take care of her. Um, you know, but, but you were coming into the family, so that's how it was. So now... What's happened now is the scheme is getting deeper and deeper and deeper and David's popularity is rising and Saul is diminishing. And so uh, Saul offers David to come into his family that he might be able to marry his oldest daughter. And so David says, uh, I'm ready to give you, or excuse me, uh, Saul says to David, I'm ready to give you my older daughter, Mirab. And of course, I'm going to go through this quickly. Someone else decided to marry her. Oh, by the way, <clears throat> just so you know, Marriages were prearranged in biblical times. In other words, uh, you know, if, if me and Kelly had another couple that was a friend of ours, they might be two years old playing, you know, Legos or blocks. And we decide on a certain day that this boy's going to marry that girl, and that's just how it is. And you ain't got no say-so over it. That's just how it's going to be. Now, see, I know you don't want to go back there now. See, nowadays we do a little bit of dating, you know, see if I like this girl, see if, I, if she likes me. But back then it was more about the economy of the family than it was your happiness and your satisfaction. But, but just so you know. So uh, David says, but who am I and what is my family in Israel that we should be a king's son-in-law? So David He's looking at this position as being highly esteemed. He's showing constant respect, even though this man's scheming to kill him. 
David exclaimed, my father's family is nothing. And so when the time came for Saul to give his daughter Mirab in marriage, he gave her to uh, Adriel instead. So um, I don't know if he meant to do this to make David mad or what, but in the meantime, Saul's daughter Michael fell in love with David. Saul was delighted when he heard that. Here's another chance to see uh, him killed by the Philistines. Now, I'm going to show you what he's trying to do. Saul said to himself, but to David, he said, today you have a second chance to be my son-in-law. Do you see the Lord showing us both sides of this? What Saul's really thinking is, is I'm going to have, see, he's going to ask for such a dowry here. You ain't never seen nothing like this. He says, so Saul told his men to say to David, the king really likes you. All of it are lies. The king don't like him. And so do we. Why don't you accept the king's offer and become his son-in-law? And when Saul's men said these things to David, he replied, how can a poor man from a humble family afford the bride's price for the daughter of a king? How can I ever pay such a dowry? Well, he was a man of war. He was a warrior. You saw that. And when Saul's men reported this back, he told him, tell David that all I want for the bride's price, all I want now, guys, y'all, y'all hold on, is 100 of my enemies, Philistines, foreskin. Let me pause. Brothers, you understand what I'm talking about, right? Circumcision is removal of the foreskin of the male genitalia. Y'all with me? Say Amen. Something that happened to me when I was like two days old and all of my boys, I don't remember it and I don't want to. I don't have no desire to go back. Are y'all with me? I got an uncle that had that procedure done when he was about 40. He said it nearly killed him. Are y'all with me? But let me ask you this. Now, what is the probability that you're going to get killed if you're going to try to circumcise a hundred Philistines? They're your enemy to start with. So in in short, he was going to have to kill all hundred of them, as you would me. So I want you to catch this, but he, he says, I want vengeance on my enemies. Now, that is partially true. Saul would like to have some vengeance on his enemies. But he's put this man, David, up to something that's going to be so tough that he just quite sure David's going to die trying And so, notice David. Here again, I don't know how he does it. Verse 26, David was delighted to accept the offer. (laughs) Before the time expired, he and his men went out and killed 200 Philistines. So David was like, all right, man, uh that's that's all you want, 100? And he brings, I want to show you something. When God is with you, It doesn't matter how daunting it looks. God is going to see you through. So David fulfilled the king's requirement by presenting all the foreskins to him. Saul gave his daughter Michael to David to be his wife. And when Saul realized that the Lord was with David and how much his daughter Michael actually loved David, watch this, Saul became even more afraid. Saul became even more afraid. And he remained David's enemies, or his enemy for the rest of his life. Now watch this. Every time the commanders of the Philistines attacked, David was more successful against them than all of the rest of Saul's officers. So David's name became very famous. Strange dowry request, isn't it? I mean, strange. Here's the deal. A strange request requiring a hundred foreskins of the enemy, the Philistines, for David to marry the daughter of the king. Saul certainly wanted him to see him dead. He was hoping he would die in this attempt to fulfill the dowry. But the fact is, Then no matter how deplorable the plan, no matter how deep the plot, it doesn't matter what the devil's trying to do to destroy us. No matter what kind of setup, 1 Samuel 18 is filled with constant reminders that God was with David 
and that the Lord fights our battles for us. It is not, you remember when they were trying to stamp out the early Christians and the young lawyer Gamaliel come up with some great advice and he says, leave them alone. He said, if this thing is not of God, it'll come to naught. He said, but if it is of God and you fight it, you will find yourself fighting against God. So, no matter what's going on, God is on our side. No matter what Saul did, it turned out okay for David. And I'm going to tell you, that's our heritage. When we maintain our faithfulness to God, no matter how bad it looks, I mean, it looked like today we're going on for the last time. It's over now for us. Never going to rise again. You know, that's just how it is. And God somehow turns the tide when we're surrounded by those who would love to see us fail. By those who don't have our best interest in mind. When those closest to us are saying one thing and yet scheming something else. Please understand, you can fool me sometimes. You can fool my friends sometimes. You can fool colleagues, but you can never, never fool God. None of the time. David wrote it, and Mahalia Jackson sang it. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Amen? He sees every hair that falls to the ground. He sees every bird that drops from the sky. The Bible says, consider the sparrow. He does not plant nor sow. Yet God sees that he's taken care of. Consider the lilies of the field. They don't toil and they don't spin, but God takes care of them. (coughs) And Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of them. So you can be surrounded by people that hate you. By people that set up plots and ploys and lies to destroy you. The people saw through the king's plot and the Bible said their heart was drawn to David. And God had given David a faithful friend. It happened to be Saul's son. Isn't isn't God working this thing out? Jonathan's his best friend. And Michael, the sister of Jonathan and the daughter of the king, is now his wife. And David's done everything he could do to kill him, and he just can't do it. I'm going to tell you something. When God decides to look after you and to take care of you, there ain't a demon in hell that can kill you if he wants to. I want to remind you, when Satan came to God about Job, he says, um, he says, let me touch you his things, and he'll curse you to your face. And God says, take all he's got. So he killed all ten kids, took his wealth, his money, all of his uh, reputation, and the Bible said Job sat in sackcloth and ashes and said, naked came I into the world, and naked will I leave. God has given and God has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord forevermore. The devil come back and said, well, you know, that was his things. Let me touch his body and he'll curse you to your face. And God said, okay, you can touch his body, but you cannot have his life. He was smitten from the top of his head to the soles of his feet with oozing boils where he grabbed pottery and scraped his oozing sores. He stunk with corruption and infection. His friends stood aloof and a long way from him. I want to tell you something. When God is on your side, his friends said for all kind of reasons, Job, you, you have sinned and you're lying about it. You're hiding something. And finally, when those friends asked God to forgive them, God says, if you'll ask Job, if he'll forgive you, then I will. God's got you back. I'm trying to give somebody some reassurance today. Notice this. Saul did everything he could to make sure that David died. He tried on a number of occasions to kill himself. When that didn't work, he schemed up something, a trap for him. Surely that he'd walk into it and die. But listen, if God is for you, 
who can be against you? It is not just cliche. It is an absolute fact. If God is on my side, blessed whose nation, blessed is the nation whose, whose God is the Lord. Let me say this about David and we'll pray. Most people are corrupted by praise and popularity to the same degree that they are crushed by scorn and criticism. Because of what God built in David out on a shepherd's field, David could live his life more for God than he did for the people. It wasn't that David didn't care about the people or what they thought, he, it, it, but he could keep their opinion in its own little place in perspective so that he could pay more attention to the opinion of God. So many times we're moved by what people think. And, and you know, we are human. And I get that. You, nobody wants to be rejected. We want to be liked by the people. But if you're going to serve God and you're going to be a leader, sometimes you're going to tick some people off. Some of them are going to get mad. But you know what? We can't raise up a flag. The only time I raise up a flag to see which way the wind's blowing is when I'm skydiving. I need to know which way to land. Other than that, I need to hear from God and speak the truth and understand and be reassured that God is on my side and if God be for me, who can be against me? Listen, if you're serving the Lord and He's for you, who can stand against you? Stand with me if you will. A strange thing that He would ask for a hundred foreskins, His idea was to kill Him. But in the strongest plot against your life, there is God. He's not going to let you, if you, you just stay true to Him, He's not going to let you be thrown under the bus, killed by the enemy. Heads are bowed. I wonder if you're here today and say, Pastor, I sure could use that reassurance right now. Let me see your hand. God bless you. Let me pray for you. Father, there's some people going through some hard things. Some tough times, just like David did at the palace. And David needed and he got the reassurance that you were with him. Saul was saying one thing out of one side of his mouth and doing something else from the other side. Constantly lying and scheming. In a world where Christians are often set up, in a world where it seems like Nobody cares sometimes. In a world where it seems like the, the, the deck is stacked against us, Lord, encourage my brothers and sisters to know, to be reassured that God is on our side. Help us, Lord, to stay true in this crazy world. No matter what the plot may be, let your plan prevail. In Jesus' name. Amen.